Great, thank you. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm Rohan. Um, yeah, and today we're going to be talking to you about AI data provenance. So really quickly, um, we're going to be talking through you know, uh, the motivation, why is this important, um, is it existing techniques about how people think about data provenance, um, the version one of our system plus the demo, privacy concerns, the version two of our system, uh, and finally extensions to the project. So why are we here talking about AI data provenance? Um, knowing where an image comes from, where content comes from, is incre incredibly important to inform how you perceive that content. If I'm on X or Instagram uh, and I see an image or a video, um, it, it's very helpful for me to know whether that image came from a camera or OpenAI Sora. Um, and it informs how um, I, I perceive that content. Um, as of today, if I just see something on X or, or on Instagram, it's very, to, very easy to assume that it's real. Um, you know, I, I see an image of Vitalik, I tell my friends about it, they tell their friends about it, um, and misinformation spreads. People are thinking about this. Um, the Biden-Harris administration recently added language to a bill um, stating that they want to protect consumers from AI-generated content. Um, lawmakers are thinking about it. Uh, Tennessee lawmakers recently moved to regulate AI and deepfakes. Um, so how are people currently thinking about data provenance um, and, and tracking content throughout the web? The most obvious thing that we can do is say, hey, um, I know where an image comes from. Let me just encode that information uh, into uh, directly in the image's pixels or uh, the frequency domain of an image or even some latent representation of the image. Um, the issue is that in real world settings, transformations like JPEG compression, crops, screenshots, um, taking a picture of something with my phone corrupts the data representation of the image so much that, <clears throat> excuse me, so much that we can still tell that it's the same image. Um, you know, if you look at a screenshot of an image, you know that it's the same image. Um, but the actual data representation of the image uh, is corrupted, and any watermark is lost. Um, stable Diffusion currently uses some form of image watermarking to um, encode that it's a Stable Diffusion image. Um, but it works so poorly that if you generate a Stable Diffusion image and download it from the web, um, the JPEG comp compression corrupts the watermark. Um, another obvious thing that we can do is say, hey, if, if embedding data into the image or into a video is too hard, um, why don't we just uh, encode um, some metadata alongside the image? Um, and so this is what uh, the C2PA, an organization that uh, um, is meant for data provenance, does. Um, they assign an image, uh, add it to like the JPEG metadata, um, and accordingly I can now see things like, uh, you know, this image was edited or um, this image originated from a Canon camera. The issue with something like this is that um, it's pretty trivial to lose the metadata. Even if I don't mean it and I send an image to a friend or upload it to a social network, um, the image that's being uploaded is no longer the same Im image that had that metadata. Um, it's also trivial to lose the metadata um, if you want to actually just remove it. And so the two observations that number one, embedding data into an image uh, is incredibly hard in the face of real world transformations um, and number two, embedding data alongside it is also very difficult, um, which led us to develop Proteus. So in Proteus, we decouple the data provenance problem into two parts. Um, the first part is we need to be able to track content on the web, regardless of these real world modifications. Again, things like screenshots, slight crops, downscaling, compression. Um, the second thing is because we no longer embed data directly into an image um, or into a piece of content, we now need to be able to prove that the content that you're looking at actually came from some original piece of content um, that was created. So to solve the first part of this, which is again, tracking content regardless of modification in the web, uh, we use something called perceptual hashes. Uh, perceptual hashes aren't cryptographic hashes, but rather a set of algorithms that lets us create compact representations, usually 32 to 128 bytes um, of content, not only images, but things like audio and video, um, that then let us uh, loosely, map back, loosely map back to it. Um, today, perceptual hashes are used for things like uh, checking copyright infringement, content filtering, um, and for our use case, they're very useful to tell, uh, be able to tell whether or not some piece of content that you're looking on, uh, on the web uh, appeared somewhere um, in our registry. Sweet. So Daniel just went through how we track modified pieces of content on the internet. Now let's get into how we can actually prove that these modified pieces of content are coming from original verified pieces of content. So we basically designed a two-phase system the first phase being the content generation phase. So what happens here is we have a content producing organization like Midjourney, OpenAI. They generate an image, and once it's generated, we take that image, 
we compute a bunch of its perceptual hashes, and we store it into some private image registry. Correspondingly, we also take the SHA hashes of all these perceptual hashes, and we commit them to a public data store along with any of the image metadata and a signature that we'd want to include. So from there on the flip side, we have the content consumption phase of this, where let's say a user is viewing some piece of content online um, on a platform like Twitter, for example, and they have the question, where is this image coming from? So what we do is we take the image that they're viewing, we call it the target image, and this target image can have been modified in many different ways. We compute the perceptual hash of this target image, and then we check our internal registry to see if there's a perceptual hash that is similar to the perceptual hash of this target image. From there, we perform a Bayes optimization process to actually figure out if there's a set of transformations that we can apply to the original image that will take us um, to an image that has an equivalent perceptual hash to this target image. Um, if it's possible, we then take those transformations and we return them to the user along with uh, the original image's metadata and signature, et cetera. And from there, a user can understand that an image that they're viewing online is coming from some content producer like Midjourney, OpenAI, et cetera. So to zoom into how this Bayesian optimization actually works, again, the purpose of the Bayesian optimization is to understand if there's a set of transformations we can apply on the original image such that the outputted image's p-hash will be equivalent to the target image. So we take the original image, we perform um, a combination of these different transformations, and we do that with the goal of minimizing our objective function, which is just the hemming distance between the perceptual hash of the target image and the perceptual hash of the transformed image. Um, if it converges, we know there's a match, and then we can return those transformations back to the user. Um, otherwise, the result's inconclusive. The reason we use Bayesian optimization here is because Bayesian optimization works really well with black box functions like neural hash, which is one of the perceptual hashes that we use. And again, the overarching goal of this is to um, realize that content online can be modified, but we can still attribute it back to original verified pieces of content. Great, so now to talk about some privacy considerations that we've had with the uh, V1 of the system. Um, so there are a lot of cases where uh, someone takes an image or creates an image and they want parts of that image to be private. Um, for example, in, in this image right here, the person on the left didn't consent to being uh, in a photo that's published online, um, and so in the actual photo that's published, they're cropped out. Um, the second thing is if I'm AI generating an image, uh, say on Dolly or Midjourney, um, there's oftentimes PII in the prompt uh, that, that is sensitive. Like for example, I can prompts mid-journey to generate an image of my friend Rohan and reveal some details about him that I don't want other people knowing. Um, and so orga organizations like OpenAI, when we've spoken to them, um, are actually very concerned about, th about this problem of prompt leakage. And so they don't want, uh, they don't always want original images to be um, just available. Um, and, and so one thing that uh, we do in our system is we're able to remove the trust dependence on our lookup. Um, so we're able to generate a proof that number one, some image actually exists in our private registry. And number two, that for a piece of content that you're looking at online, um, you can uh, back that out and get the original image um, through a proof without actually revealing uh, the private image or the transformations that were applied to that image. So more specifically, uh, you know, a, a public input uh, into our proof uh, is an organization's public key. Um, private inputs are obviously the private image. The transformations from the Bayesian optimization that Rohan was just talking about um, and a signature um, from whoever created it on the image. Uh, and our goal is to prove that we can take the original image, apply these transformations to it, and get a perceptual hash that's equal to the perceptual hash of the image that you're seeing online. So again, proving that the content that you're looking at came from some private image, but not actually disclosing the image or the transformations that it took to get there. Great, so I'm gonna walk you through a, a quick demo. Um, Um, so say I'm browsing Twitter, <laughs> I see a picture of Elon, Elon's getting arrested, um, but before I go and tell my friends, uh, I click on the Proteus I here, uh, and we can see two things. 
The first is that the image was created by Midjourney v5 on some date. And the second uh, is that this image is actually a screenshot. Um, and again, through the Bayesian optimization, we actually know exactly what happened to it. So it was JPEG compressed and, and actually upscaled a little bit. Um, and so again, how did this work? Uh, first, we took the perceptual hash of the content that you're seeing on the web, which is this uh, screenshotted version of Elon, took its perceptual hash, and we're able to map it, map it back to a perceptual hash that's in our private registry, which is this, uh, um, the top image, which, which is the original image. Um, and to further visualize some of the perceptual hashes, I'm actually going to walk through and uh, get the perceptual hash of both the screenshotted image and the original one, um, just to visualize how we're doing this matching process. Um, in this demo, the Bayesian optimization was pre-computed because it currently still takes a long time, um, but it's very possible to optimize. So here we can see that the perceptual hashes um, of the two images are similar, <laughs> which allows us to map back to the original image. Awesome. So Daniel just addressed some of the privacy concerns that come along with revealing the original images to users. Um, but another valid privacy concern is actually storing all these original images somewhere, which in V1 existed in this private internal registry. But a lot of content organizations don't actually want to store users' original images anywhere. And one, for, scale, for scalable reasons, but also for privacy reasons. So with that, we designed Proteus V2, which accounts for this. So here, the flow looks very similar. There's a content producing organization. They generate some media, and from there, what we actually do is compute a bunch of transformed versions of that original image, and then we take the SHA hashes or the perceptual hashes of all these different images and commit them all to some public data store. The important thing to note here is that we're never actually storing the original image anywhere, only the SHA hashes or the perceptual hashes. And with that, you might be thinking it's impossible to account for every single transformation, which is why we introduced this notion of probability bounds. So what we actually do is, with the original image's p hash, we can break it up into several chunks, and then take the SHA hashes of the individual chunks. Then when we're considering some target image, we can replicate this process, where we split its perceptual hash into several chunks, and then compute the SHA hashes of the individual chunks to have a chunked SHA perceptual hash, essentially. And using that, we can actually match these chunks to come up with a probability of match, rather than it having to be a binary yes or no. And then on the content consumption side of this, uh, again, the flow looks very similar. A user is viewing some piece of content on a platform like Twitter. Uh, they ask themselves, where does this image come from? We take the target image that we're looking at, we also modify it a bunch, and then we compute the SHA hashes, the perceptual hashes of each of them, and then we see if there's a match in the public data store, and this is where we can leverage the probability bounds, and instead of looking for an exact match, uh, look for a probability of match, and then at the end, return that back to the user so the user can understand there is a X probability that this image is coming from Midjourney, OpenAI, et cetera, um, for which there is some verified original piece of content that was produced. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so you mentioned neural hash. I believe Apple used it some time ago. But do you know that it's possible to generate? So it's not cryptographically secure hash, and it's possible to generate collisions as well as to slowly, slightly modify image to avoid uh, detections and severely modify the hash. So how would that system work, given that neural hash is essentially backdoored in a way? Yeah, yeah. So um, the question is. Uh, Certain perceptual hashing algorithms like neural hash um, have adversarial attacks. You can modify an image uh, to make it uh, have the same neural hash as something else and not look the same. Uh, the answer is we use a combination of perceptual hashing algorithms. So for every image, we store um, at least four perceptual hashes. Uh, um, and, and so like one, one collision and one perceptual hash doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, we won't be able to recover that image because the perceptual hashes are only used to find candidate images. And the Bayesian optimization is run on all those uh, candidate images to actually see if we can get the original image. But if 
in the version t version two, if you don't have the original images, then you cannot run it, and it's more perceptible. If I find four collisions, right, it's more one. susceptible, but then we add more perceptual hashes. <laughs> Okay, I think we have to move on, but I think uh, the two of you are still like available for further discussions during the break later on. So, thanks again.